I spent about 15 years in the, in the violent far right. I found myself uh, down at Aryan Nations, hanging out with skinheads and becoming um, not just a follower, but a, a leader in that movement. And I uh, left about 20 years ago, and I'm motivated by the desire to help people who are where, where I once was. Life After Hate, we all kind of met up in, in Ireland for the first time as a group. We all had this sense that it would have been nice to have some sort of support from someone who had like direct experience who could influence some of our thoughts and behaviors instead of having to go through that process alone. Um, the change process is a very lonely process without that. After 16 years of, of prison, after about 20 years of living, living in that life, um, I dedicate our, our, all of our efforts towards helping other men and women um, address those same concerns. The hardest thing in the world to do is to have compassion for someone who has no compassion. Um, but I think sometimes they're the ones that, that need us need it uh, the most. I do think that historically we have gone through various populations believing that those populations cannot change, that they can't be redeemed, that they're broken beyond repair. But all the research supports us, all the evidence supports us. Life After Hate is full of evidence of people who have gone to great depths but who are now going to great heights. When we go into a violent extremist group, we basically excommunicate ourselves from friends, family and society. When we go to leave that violent extremist group, we have to excommunicate ourselves again. And friends, family, and society aren't waiting with open arms to, to welcome us back. One of the amazing things that Life After Hate has done is created an online social peer support group in which people don't have to be alone as they go through, through that, that journey. Disengagement is not the end point. It's just the beginning and, and as an organization, we're not happy, we're not satisfied if someone just disengages and that's it. Um, you know, we want to get them to de-radicalization, we want to get them to healing, and we would ideally like to get them to helping heal the communities that they've once harmed. What we have been recognized for is our ability to make a connection with another human being who is really questioning um, whether or not this is the life they want to continue in. There's the complexity that comes with, um, it's not uncommon for the family dynamic to be a part of the problem, mm. uh, you know, and. and and, and, a, and a part of the anger that's being acted out and, and such like that. So that, and, and that requires a whole other skill set to, to unravel. And uh, I wish we had more resources to refer to. Uh, as a father, it's important for me to hear from my children. And my kids share things with me that quite honestly, I can understand why parents don't want to hear it. It is, it is, it, is, it hurts, it's, it, it damages you as a parent to hear some of the things they have to go through and face and decisions they make on their own. But if, they, if, if I don't create that space where they can tell me those things, who are they telling? My first real taste of compassion came from my children. Mm -hmm. You know, if I think of where I was at that time in my life, I was completely cut off from my, my heart, operating from ego and, and narcissism. I'm holding my daughter for the first time and, and I had a son 15 months later and I got to parent him the way I always wanted to be parented. And they looked at, at me with the unconditional love and they saw this magnificent human being that I didn't see when I looked in the mirror. It started to shift things and that um, receiving compassion, um, in a, if he could love me then I could learn to love myself. Receiving compassion from someone who we feel we don't deserve it from was an extremely powerful gift, although I'm not saying it's the responsibility of marginalized communities sure. to take that on. Mm -hmm.